Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the FPGA meetup on the 9th of April, 2024 for Open Research Institute. We talk about what we've done, what we have planned to do in the future, if we need any resources, and if we have any roadblocks. And we have a lot to report. The slides only show uh, a slice of it, but we're going to go through the slides first, and then we'll pick up on any other projects that need to be talked about or any other questions that we have. So welcome, everybody. Overview, the expected deliveries for uh, opulent voice, which is related to Hypharia, our transponder for um, for space and terrestrial. Uh, the the delivery for the the um, transmitter side, the uplink side, uh, for a sounding rocket test at Wallops with the University of Puerto Rico, is scheduled for August of 2024. Also in August, we have expected delivery of a demonstration of Neptune. Um, also in August 2024 at DEF CON. So Neptune is a five gigahertz uh, drone link, data link, and it's a OFDM. It's it's really cool. And there's lots going on with the specification definition and, and also uh, prototyping. Uh, so these are two different projects with two different uh, modulations. Neptune is OFDM and uh, very LTE, Wi-Fi, 5G, in in tone and opulent voice is a, a minimum shift keying. It was a four ARI FSK uh, deployment, but we've we've transitioned to a more efficient uh, minimum shift keying um, uh, modulation, and the the framing stays the same. Uh, so the the design that you've seen in the the document for that stays the same, uh, and we have a. As, as mentioned, we have a sounding rocket opportunity to test it with the University of Puerto Rico in August. So we're working hard towards that. We're about midway through our three week sprint or set of sprints for that. So the progress that we're gonna talk about today, recent progress with the Pluto SDR opulent voice transmitter and the general purpose processor opulent voice for University of Puerto Rico transceiver uh, with some efforts to get it independent of GNU radio so that we have a a modem or a mo, because um, it's just the modulation side uh, that's working with um, off-the-shelf hardware that's easy to set up. So so far, from my point of view, the biggest risk is the lack of documentation for all of these things that we're trying to do, and and just a reminder that we need to do a much better job. We need to leave the place better than we found it when it comes to documentation and explaining it for the people that come after us or are working with us. So yes, welcome, welcome to the meetup. So let's talk first about the progress on the general purpose processor opulent voice for uh, University of Puerto Rico work. Um, and I'll I'll let Paul speak to the slides. Okay. Um, the first thing we had to do was get back to where we were last time we tried to do anything together with the University of Puerto Rico folks. And uh, that was a matter of reestablishing the prototype which transmits with GNU Radio and receives with the C++ implementation of OPV DMOD. Uh, they had been told at some point in the development process and by us, by me basically, that the March 9th release was the, the one that was known to work. And I mean, not really a release, it was just a check-in. Uh, so they've been using that and they've been having trouble getting the same demo to work. Uh, working on intermittently over the last nearly a year and uh, lots of other disasters going on befalling them in the lab and difficulties with rockets and floods and probably plagues of locusts for all I know. Um, so that's still a, a, a milestone that yet to be reached. We've got it working here in the lab again uh, without too much trouble. And uh, they're still trying. I think What's left is they probably don't have the frequencies uh, calibrated. The, the code is at that level of development is not very uh, robust to frequency error. So if you don't get the frequencies tuned right in, then they won't work very well or won't work at all, depending on how far off they are. Uh, from there, I want to jump to the current version of the C++ code that's checked in. That's from about May of last year. And... Uh, it has some big advancements. It increase, includes the protocol, 
stack overhead, which changes the symbol rate. And there are a bunch of little details of making it work well that had been revisited and improved. So if we can get up to that level, then we'll have a better implementation of the, the Fourier FSK to work with. The biggest limitation of the of that as it stood in, in May is that it still didn't have uh, a live transmitter. It could generate uh, symbols in the sense that they are samples of the frequency deviation at an instantaneous frequency deviation. Um, but the intention was that that would go into an actual FM transmitter uh, left over from previous people with their fingers on the code. And um, that's not handy if you're using an SDR. What you need is IQ samples of the actual waveform. So what we've been doing in the past is running it through a flow graph and GNU radio, which had some good advantages for, uh, well, for ease of implementation, obviously, but also for demo purposes, because the GNU radio provides lots of visualizations. You can actually see what you're transmitting, um, and that's nice. But GNU radio is not something you want to launch on a sounding rocket, probably. Um, so what we need to do now is to bring that modulator part of the code into into this stream uh, i chose to take a two-step approach my first step that i'm working on now is to make a standalone modulator uh, on the receive side we're using a standalone program that, that pre-existed thank goodness called rtl fm which is an fm receiver that works with an rtl sdr or or laterally some uh, other sdr hardware uh, it's a, it's a, just a command line thing that streams samples out that it received over the air. And so I'm going to create the opposite thing that receives samples um, of instantaneous deviation and then puts out the IQ uh, samples to an SDR and using the Pluto for that, which is, I believe, what the University of Puerto Rico folks are planning on launching. So that will probably end up uh, in phase two being implement in integrated right into the modulator code so that there's no need for any kind of a command line pipeline that would be uh, off the chart on the well actually I guess that's a compliment accomplishment too as it's written here on the on the slide so that's where we're at uh this is all pre uh, any waveform change we're still stuck with the uh, the four fsk um, implementing the c++ code with the different modulation and the the fancier stuff that, that goes into the uh, MSK uh, implementation will be a bigger deal. And that's down the road at some point, I guess. Yeah, okay. hopefully not uh, too far down the road. All right, Any anything else? Um, Any comments about the remote lab itself or? Remote lab report is, uh, situation normal as far as i know uh, we did run into a little problem with <laughs> uh, disk space on, on chaco cat you know, people have been doing work somehow work consumes disk space um, so we found some work that was a little stale and moved it off to a different drive and we're able to move forward with some delay it takes an amazing amount of time to copy 40 gigabytes of stuff across <laughs> Um, so that's that's all that's going on with the remote lab right now. Yeah, thank you for for helping with that. That would be a a pretty big blocker. Um, and then we we do have a I'm concerned about the the patch um, on Karapi for for to glibc, which is required to get Simulink to work on Ubuntu 18.04. This has cropped up a couple of times, and and it seems to be the thing that's preventing. Um, uh, Vivado from doing simulations over in Karapi, so been relying on ChocoCat more these days. And if it can crop up there, then it might be able to crop up other places. So some of the other bugs that we've, or some of the other roadblocks that we've been experiencing, I'm now a little bit paranoid that that glibc patch causes more problems, um, more unexpected problems. And I, I know this is speculation on my part. I don't have proof on this, but moving uh, simulation over to ChocoCat for both Cobb's decoder and for the uh, opulent voice work cleared up the problems with the simulator. So I'm a little bit leery. I think that Karapi should be used for Simulink and MATLAB. It it can be used for compiling 
the the raw HDL reference designs, but like doing any sort of serious work over there, which is unfortunate because that's where the the ZCU 102 and the ADR V9002 are attached. Um, but doing any sort of serious work over there until this is kind of cleared up needs to be like the stuff needs to be done over on Chaco Cat, and then the the end result, the the work product needs to be uh, exported over to the uh, Trivial FTP boot directory, and and then we boot from JTAG over there with the work work product. It'd be really great if we could get both Karapi and ChocoCat working perfectly, and that this GLibc thing was not a factor at all. Uh, I I did I spent a couple of minutes trying to track this down and update myself, but I see no progress since last year when when it became clear that I had to do this patch to get Simulink to work. Um, and for those that are not familiar with this patch, Simulink won't even launch without this being done. And and it is a tricky process, but like we did it and it worked, uh, but the repercussions appear to be um, kind of annoying. So that leads me to believe that either we didn't do the patch right or or that's just the way it is. or And we may be able to get around this by upgrading our operating system from 1804 to 2004, um, which means looking very carefully at what 2004 supports, because not all versions of Ubuntu support all of the versions of Vivado, et cetera, that we have. So yeah, there was uh, a particular reason why we had to peg 18.04. Yes, it was the last version that, that supported the versions of Vivado. That was, that was as far as they went. But time has passed, and it would be good to go back and and review all of that to see if we can upgrade, because possibly uh, the this GLibc problem might we might be able to outrun it, or it may be a permanent solution from from the point of view of MathWorks. I don't know yet, but that's a that's an ongoing sort of issue. Um, so I think that that and and Ken is going to. Uh, talk about this next, but the work that we've done for Opulent Voice HDL, some of the weird errors. I think that that moving everything over to ChocoCat and not doing, not trying to do any Vivado work or any of the HDL uh, customizing IP in the HDL reference, not doing any of that work on Karapi might be the right answer. So eliminating risk is is what we're about for the most part, and you know, because what we do is already risky enough. <laughs> you know, don't take on any unnecessary risks. So that's an ongoing problem in the in the lab, and it's a big difference between Karapi and ChocoCat. They're they were supposed to be the same, except for the the hardware attached. Um, but in order to run Simulink and MATLAB, we had to make a a, a pretty you know, kind of do a little brain surgery on GLibc, which touches a lot of things in an operating system. And the repercussions appear to be related to that. It's and like again, I caution that it's not proven, but that that's a concern, ongoing concern. So some time is going to have to be spent to track that down. Do we know that the GLibc patch is no longer required on later versions? If I don't know that yet, I I went out and spent a couple of minutes trying to track that down. And all I saw was after some version in the past and no update that, oh, by the way, you don't need to do this anymore. There are people that I can reach out to uh, through our license with the with MathWorks um, that might be able to to track this down for sure and tell me. So I'll take the action item to to go figure it out. That'd be worth asking, but you never know for sure unless you try it yourself. Because That's right. Be um, That's right. They it's, might be relying on us to test it. So, <laughs> relatively easy to spin up a a test VM and and try it. Oh, that would be fun. Separately, yeah. Uh, let's I'd have to run it on the array because it wouldn't have a another SSD hanging around to dedicate to it. But well, yeah, as long we might be able to find find a space for it. Yeah, as long as it has enough space to install Simulink and MATLAB, then then we can test it. That'd be good if we can launch it at all. Then then we know. How much space does it take to get to where you can launch it? I'm not sure off the top of my head, but it'd be good good experiment to see. I'll okay. also, yeah, GLibc version and also 
to, I'll take the action item to like see what what the current status is for Vivado support. You know, for uh, Ubuntu is is at that's relatively easy to. It's a table on their their website that I have to assume has been updated over the past year or so. So we'll figure it out. We'll take it. We'll take this and and run with it. Yeah, we'll need to strategize exactly what version I want to build for the test. Okay. Sounds like a plan. Thank you. That's a lot of work behind the scenes to make things work better, you know. Cuz the the bugs that we get that we that that like we introduce, that's hard enough. We don't need anything extra. <laughs> you know. You got plenty of extra anyway. Yeah, plenty of extra anyway. All right, thank you. Okay, so Opulent Voice is our uplink uh, a native digital protocol for for Hyperia and and other 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 programs, and it's uh it's really neat. So we have this pretty cool protocol. It does uh, voice and data, and is uh it's a modern and and uh, and most importantly for voice, it's high fidelity. So it's a it's really nice um, sixteen kilobits per second. Uh, Opus uh, codec is is supported, uh, and it sounds sounds amazing. So that's that's what we're trying to implement here. The Simulink transmitter model is now producing the correct signals for minimum shift keying. So we've gone from a four area FSK, which was supposed to be, um, you know, uh, for for those of you that know, uh, so you know, point five. Uh, is the 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 figure of merit uh, for the for the deviation index, and that means that that for these sorts of signals, you're supposed to not get any sort of discontinuities, you know, no jumps when you go from one frequency to another uh, in four area FSK. So when we plowed through this and tried to actually implement it, it turns out that the better way to do it is uh, offset QPSK or minimum shift keying, and that worked. Uh, so so now we're switching uh, to uh, a minimum shift keying modulation. And this all of a sudden started working after weeks of effort, and it's really, really nice. But it does require us to change from our older, uh, non-ideal uh, four frequency frequency shift keying. So four area FSK is, is where we're at today. There's a lot of advantages to going to minimum shift keying over over this. The the biggest is the as mentioned the uh, you avoid the phase discontinuities. Um, minimum shift keying gives you very suppressed side lobes. Uh, there are claims that you do not need. Uh, you can drop some of the filters uh, because it's just so great looking and it does look amazing. Um, it is a little tricky though. It's tricky to to construct and to understand. Um, there's some pitfalls there. Uh, the receiver is really not that bad when you do a straightforward IQ style receiver. There's another design that's on the slide. The, the Massey Hodgart uh, receiver design is a little more complex, but it does demodulation, decoding, and carry, uh, uh, clock recovery all in one circuit. Okay, so that's what we've been working on in Opulent Voice Channel. And we have a simulant transmitter model that's producing the correct signals for minimum shift keying. This actually came from a test bench for the receiver. So, you know, we're like, okay, we need opulent voice. We have an opulent voice transmitter, the four area FSK. Now we need to do a receiver in our spacecraft or, you know, uh, terrestrial, uh, you know, node, central node. It's like, okay, so we st started diving in on that. And in order to test the receiver, you have to generate the the transmitter signals. And so we made a, a sort of an opulent voice transmitter in a test bench. So when it became pretty clear that we were going to need an actual transmitter uh, of, of opulent voice for the University of Puerto Rico and others, I was like, okay, well, the test bench is a good place to start for the HDL side. We already have something working as a general purpose processor transceiver. Um, but we want to transition to this MSK, so now's the good time to do it. So the test bench for the MSK was converted into an HDL coder target for a transmitter for UPR. So this is all on F in FPGA land. And when we say HDL coder, what we mean is that all of the blocks in Simulink that are used to set up this transmitter are compatible with HDL coders. So it's a 
it's possible to convert the simulate model to HDL code and then hand edit what you get. So this all this all worked. It uh, it was a lot of work, and thank you everybody that helped with this and contributed. So that's our accomplishment one here on the slide. Accomplishment two is that this the receiver design, um, which is from the mid 1990s from uh, uh, Surrey in the UK. This is in progress, but it's not working yet, and we need help here. I reached out to one of the original authors of the of this of the paper uh, that that really did the did the most towards publicizing this really interesting receiver design. And there's some some conversation there, but so far that loop is uh, is not closed. Uh, and but based on the work on this, uh, which is in our or repos, and you can see it in the, the GitHub Ops channel. Um, based on this work, it's now clear that the the more traditional, you know, IQ, multiply, digital down converter, receiver design that we worked on first, that, that was just missing the timing and clock recovery, well, it can now be completed because the clock recovery circuit from the Massey-Hodgart design actually makes sense and appears to work. So that's on the to-do list is that we can get a, this other parallel path working uh, from, from the R&D that we did with the new receiver design, more complicated design or integrated design. Okay, so that's, that's what's going on there. So the attention areas this week are on the Pluto SDR. So uh, for the for University of Puerto Rico, I'm like, okay, let's just take a Pluto. They have Plutos there. And take the HDL reference design from the Pluto, modify it with our code, with our HDL that we're working on, and get that as a transmitter from the sounding rocket down to the Earth. Okay, so that's that's the attention area. That's what we're trying to get to. Plenty to do, but making progress. Modifying this HDL reference design has actually been, um, uh, I think, and hard uh, because the documentation from analog devices that we really need their their full page this this alleged like here you go here's a, a complete handbook of how you do it has been 404 since um, early 2023. There's nothing in the Internet Archive that page is also a 404 since it's the only time it's been checked in. I have gotten nothing from the customer support so far from, and also nothing from engineer zone. So this has been very disappointing that I can't really find out, like there's no walkthrough on exactly how to drop your intellectual property into HDL reference designs. Now in their defense, uh, each, each combination of hardware is different and the there's, there's differences and enough differences between the different FPGAs and the different analog devices, radio chips, that you can't really have a one size fits all. Here's how you drop it in. However, a walkthrough of anything like what we're doing, which is just write your own file. <laughs> you want you want to get in between, you know, this block and that block. Here's how it's done would, would be great. And as far as I can tell, it doesn't really exist for, for where we're at. So we need to learn more. We need to bring our skills up higher and and take look at what we've been given and what's available to us and what we're expected to know and then continue to improve and develop our capability. But also analog devices really needs to make sure that critical web pages are not 404s. So that's that's that. That's an attention area. And then over on Neptune, uh, which is our, our drone data uh, physical layer, uh, specification and and prototype. We're in the process of submitting two articles to QEX magazine from ARL. If you know of an alternative to where this work needs could go, let me know. Um, so far, QEX has not rejected it, um, but there's not a lot of digital communications people available to review the articles. So it's there's a, a little bit of an impedance mismatch there. Um, so if you know of a place where we can submit our work to get it published, that'd be great. We have an article about the Zadoff Chu uh, sequence that we use in the preamble for for AGC. It's an AGC burst, and it's also it also lets us uh, 
I get a big step up on timing synchronization. Uh, and the other article is about space frequency block coding, an introduction to that explanation of what it is, how we designed and implemented it for Neptune, stuff like that. Um, An HDL for that is coming along. There's a lot of parts that we did for Neptune that also helped out Opulent Voice, such as the preamble transmission. So the way that we insert a preamble on push to talk is described and, and implemented and working and tested, and we leveraged that for Opulent Voice. So it's it's helped us out. And to talk about the schedule, here's today, the 9th of April. Uh, the next major milestone over at the University of Puerto Rico for the sounding rocket launch is in June. They have a meeting with NASA about this, um, so a review um, in June. So that's that's coming right up. Uh, and then in August, uh, August 11-ish, then that's our probably our biggest demonstration opportunity for the year at our village at DEF CON 32 in Las Vegas. Um, followed almost immediately by the sounding rocket launch itself from University of Puerto Rico that intends to deploy uh, opulent voice. And then in October, we expect to be a digital update for microwave in Vancouver, British, British Columbia, Canada. And if you're interested in, in workshops and meeting up and, and talking about any of this, that's where we're going to be. It'll be fun. So that's a little glimpse into the schedule for FPGA work. And then next steps, publish a method of integrating RIP into the HDL reference design that avoids the errors that we've encountered for Cobb's decoder, for the polyphase filter bank, and for opulent voice, and also uh, for the DVBS2 encoder, which actually was integrated with a, a different way um, than just making it look like an analog devices block. So we have had four major pieces of, of uh, intellectual property that we've tried to integrate into reference designs, and all of them have been somewhat difficult and, and resulted in lots of errors. So we, we really need to kind of like normalize this and, and explain it and provide uh, a guide uh, and specific examples. Um, and so the markdown document for integrating our IP is going to be the, the focus of that work. And the next step, fully support the University of Puerto Rico launch. This is a tight time schedule, um, you know, tight tight timeline, do the best we can to make sure that we support them and get this working. Um, and then to demonstrate all our work, the technical and the regulatory at DEF CON and at the digital update for microwave in, in, in uh, Vancouver in October. So the goals for next meeting are like the goals for this one. What have we done? What do we plan to do? The roadblocks and what resources are needed. Um, and so I'll turn it over to to Ken to bring us up to date on all of the things he's he's done and and everything he's done to help with uh, Opulent Voice. Yeah, I'm not sure when I last gave an update, but the uh, polyphase filter we got that finally uh, stitched in there, and it seems like it's passing timing now. So that was that was good to get that kind of set up at least uh, in an initial sense. Um, since then, I've followed some recipes to generate a bit file and get that into a uh, Petal Linux build. Um, I think that's we've got the files copied over for that, so I think it's at least built there. Um, still need to kind of do an end-to-end -end sim at some point, but uh, that's where that stands anyway. And then lately I've been helping Michelle with the uh, trying to get an equivalent block installed uh, for the Pluto database, uh, trying to follow the same recipes uh, that finally we, we, in order to Finally, get through some of the roadblocks. We tried to make the blocks look very much like what the other blocks in the analog devices uh, tree uh, in terms of how they're built and uh, what macros they're using, and they're basically presenting the same interfaces as as what what the uh, ADI blocks uh, themselves present. Um, 
So that worked on the polyphase filter. We're still fighting it uh, with the uh, trying to get to the uh, the latest uh, o OPZ for. I see. It's a transmitter block. That's about all I know about the actual details of the block. But I, I guess even that is we're we're just a, we have a, like a, a wrapper placeholder for that. Um, but uh, kind of trying to follow the same steps. Uh, it's not quite the exact same interface because I I didn't have a streaming AFI at the point I did the insert for the uh, polyphase filter. We had to actually adapt it internally. The polyphase filter has the uh, streaming AXI, but we adapted it to a FIFO here. It's uh, still uses AXI at the at the top level, but then it's like what what those stitches have to occur and what um, stitching routines you use for that. That's still something we're trying to iron out, but I think uh, you know, by close comparison between what worked and what we've got on deck here, uh, we should be able to get through the, the issues that we're seeing, I think. Just, it does take some time to try and make sure that it fits. Some of these error warnings that we get are somewhat cryptic. So, that's about it. Thank you. That, uh, that's a great summary. And thank you very much for all of your hard work on on ironing out the timing problems with the polyphase filter bank. Um, so yeah, the the efforts to build up a, a Petal Linux build that includes that as the um, uh, bit file for the, for the target. So what we'll have there is a, a channelizer actually in, in the design, and we should be able to confirm this with uh, test signals over the air um, that the, the receiver station, the FPGA design development station is with the radio card, should be able to pick up a test signal and then prove out that we're receiving what we think. And that's a, that's a big step forward um, and then go from there. I think we are going to have to do a lot of work to to configure the uh, the station uh, for the right, essentially the right sample rates, the right, uh, you know, down down conversion essentially, um, and and to do all the systems work to make everything line up correctly, um, to get down to to a ten megahertz bandwidth and to split that up is is actually a uh, a hard job for for the big radio chip. Uh, so we may have to to adjust that and to to cut in more samples or or to to start out with a wider bandwidth uh, in order to comply with the needs of the hardware. But that's not a not a big deal. Should be able to do that. So testing this out over the air makes me super happy. That's uh, that's a real proof of concept when it actually works over the air. So I'm I'm looking forward to trying it and seeing seeing what we got. All right. Any other comments, questions, or uh, goals? Anything we missed? Any resources needed? All right. Thank you, everybody. We're going to head into the lab if you are wanting to follow along with this project or join and help us out, have any advice or, or a code that you'd like to write or anything you'd like to work on, then please go to openresearch.institute on the internet and click the getting started link and follow the instructions there, get in touch, and you'll be, you'll be right in here with us doing all this fun work. So thank you everybody and see you on Slack.